Hello. Thank you for joining me again for Burn the Wagon series. I'm going to have a guest on that I grew up with, uh, Bernadette Smith. So uh, once she can pop in here, we'll start the, um, we'll start this. Hello, hello. Hey. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. All right. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Um, I haven't done it on Facebook. This is my first time on Facebook, but uh, this is working just fine, so thank you, yeah. Um, so how, how is your day going so far? I'm going pretty good. I was, uh, you know, just at the library doing a little bit of Back checking before I came on today. Just wanted to get you know things ready for when I talk about MMIW and stuff. So yeah, it's going pretty good though. You know. Awesome, absolutely. Thank you for doing that research. I I did some research the other day on some residential schools, but I didn't do a lot of research on MMIW yet. But um, we'll try to jump right in and um, give a little introduction about yourself and where you're from and uh, where your family's from and stuff like that. Okay. So my name is Bernadette Smith. Um, I grew up on the Manchester Point Arena Reservation. Um, well, I moved there when I was about 12. My father, his name is David Smith. He was born and raised um, in Point Arena on the reservation there and on Kashaya Reservation. Uh, my mom, her name is Linda. She's Chicana. She's from Hillsburg, San Jose area. So yeah, I lived on and off the reservation um, till I was about 31. So, you know, from 12 to 31 is kind of a long span. Um, my aunt, or yeah, my grandfather's sister is actually, well, you see the road Mamie Lewa? That uh -huh. was my dad's um, father's sister. So my dad's aunt, her name was Mamie Smith. That's okay. originally, so I'm Bernadette Smith. The Smith family was one of the first, you know, original families on the uh, census, the 1932 census roll. So we've been there a long time. Um, but you know being that i wasn't born there you know i i was i moved there until i was uh, well when i was 12. Uh -huh. um it made such a difference uh, about being like welcomed into the community you know i was still a little bit bullied and outcasted i felt unwelcome there for a very long time and, and that sense never really um it never went away you know and even though i've lived there so long I was always looked at, well, I felt so like as an outsider, you know, and so that just kind of gives you a sense of how the community works, how the reservation works, yeah. particularly ours, you know. Yeah. I absolutely yeah. feel ex that exact um, feeling growing up because when I moved there when I was 12, the people made, people made it known that I like I was a newcomer, I was a new kid, you know what I mean? Um, definitely got bullied, definitely felt like heard every like name in the book called me because my skin is darker, you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, like I kind of wanted to like get those stories out there as well. Like not only like it was an amazing like experience growing up on the reservation and stuff, but like there was that bullying, there was that teasing, there was that not, like you said, that feeling of not feeling like, like you're from there or whatever, you know what I mean? Just because you moved there at a certain point in your life. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah, like these, these, um, there's interracial racism as well that needs to be spoken about on reservations, like you said, you know what I mean? And um, I kind of wanted to see your thoughts on the, those little topics. Yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely that kind of like, I'll just talk a little bit, um, you know, about, like I said, growing up there, um, you know, I was 12, dealing with that, um, not feeling welcome, but, you know, Besides that, there was a lot of good memories, like, you know, things I made a lot of great friends, like I was telling you uh, on our text messages, like Yvonne, you know, yeah, her, there's a lot of like Melanie, Ilar, these young girls that were, you know, welcoming to me um, there. I made a lot of good friends there, um, you know, 
years passed and you know we all grew up and kind of went our separate ways but you know we all became who we are and you know i could admire a lot of them a lot of the women or girls i'd say girls you know they're my age i'm 34 but you know they became pretty pretty amazing women you know some of them are great mothers and you know others further their education or moved off the reservation which you know um i never thought of that as an accomplishment but you know as you get older you kind of see what they mean by when they want you to be better when they want you to make it off the reservation you know i never thought of it as a as a setback being there but you know as you get older you realize you know there's not anything there you know they put us in such rural areas where you know you can't just walk out your door and go to school you can't you know you got to literally leave your family and everything you knew behind you know which makes it extremely difficult for girls or young men to to make it past that first step you know yeah absolutely i think that's those are really amazing points you know what i mean um and yeah i remember you guys growing up always being like super like i was telling you joyful and happy all the time even though the circumstances we were in and being so far away from everything being far away from school being far away from actual things to do you know what i mean um because there's no activities on the res there's no yeah we have sports and stuff out there but there's nothing outside of sports there's no you know i was never encouraged i always wanted to be part of like the theater like you know like stuff like that like we need to encourage our youth to do more things like that instead of just sports and stuff you know i think we need to educate more and read more um because i was never taught like you should educate yourself and that's what like i see everyone doing now is educating themselves on not only their culture but like just things in general like going just wanting to go to school and like i think that's very important for us you know what i mean to educate and educate as much as possible because like i was i was always taught like to learn is to, i was like a white thing yeah you know and um i think we just need to like push that aside and just like ed like encourage people to educate themselves like you you know i see you in like doing a lot of educational things you know i think you were a part of like some movie and stuff right um actually i was just watching your dad's youtube thing on alcatraz the other day getting ready for this uh, this um interview actually yeah. and that was yeah amazing. so um like how you said about the theater um you know, there are a lot of things and a lot of different opportunities that the youth have. And, you know, when it comes to thinking outside the box, uh, you know, I do a lot of work with ACORN and we can talk a little bit more in depth about that later. But as far as, you know, um, bringing these opportunities to the youth on the reservation, there's been opportunities that I've had um, working around the ACORN and telling the story about the ACORN tree and how the deforestation is affecting our people, particularly on the Mendocino coast. Uh, I was able to, to link up with uh, Dancing Earth, which is an indigenous um, contemporary dance. Um, I, what is it? It's not a school, it's a company, dance company. Okay. You know, so we were able to, I don't know if you know or are familiar with what contemporary dance could look like. It's kind of like, you know, like with slow moving, yeah. you know, telling the story with movements and yeah, body and yeah. expression. So um, it looked kind of strange the first time I seen it. You know, I, I went to a, I went to a conference where they were trying to see how they could recognize indigenous protocols and, and honor indigenous practices while still being able to teach this in university, the style of indigenous contemporary dance. So my father was on the panel speaking. And during that time, I was able to see a couple performances of uh, Native people who had made these artistic dance pieces, you know, telling these really important stories. One was about smallpox and the blankets that were brought to her people. You know, another was a creation story. Um, so I was, you know, able to make one that told the story of the acorn and use the and the youth from the reservation to tell this story. And there was a couple of the kids that were just amazing dancers and, you know, they're beautiful traditional dancers, but, you know, introducing them into a different style, a more artistic form, they were so good. They, they brought tears to people's eyes. Wow. You know, so being able to let them experience different things and let them see like, look, you guys can have careers in this. You guys can still honor your people in, in a good way, you know, and, and be praised in a good way, you know, for, for doing that. 
And you don't always have to be on show, on a, on a museum piece of showing our traditional ways only, you know? There's different ways to express being Native in our stories without having to always be a performance, like as far as performing our traditional ways, you know? Absolutely. And that took a long time for me to get into um, to that understanding of, of what we were doing. I was always honored to go and do traditional things and, you know, dancing and singing and, and museums and stuff like that, just to kind of let them know that we're still here. But as you get older and you kind of, you know, see those fingers pointing like, oh, there's an Indian. Oh, look, they're in. It's like, no, we're not artifacts. You know, yeah. we're not walking artifacts. We're a living, evolving people, you know. So, um, you know, the kids being introduced to that form of theater was actually a beautiful thing and they really enjoyed it. And it was exactly what I hoped they would be able to do, you know? So um, uh, hopefully more things like that can come to the reservations. I think it's really important for kids to be able to express themselves and to get out of their comfort zones, you know, because when we're on the reservation, we have a stereotype of ourselves, you know? Like how you said, like education is for white people, yeah. you know, or, you know, things like that. A lot of us, think like that even though we don't want to I know we don't really want to because we know you know we know how the world works but you know we also have those pressures of people like looking at us like we're not proud to be native if we step out and do those things but luckily today you know you see a lot of um a lot of change like Ayana Robinson you know she's really become a spokes you know, person for the to, for the youth of Point Arena, you know, like an inspiration story of, you know, look at, you could be coming from living on the res your whole life, you know? Yeah. Your parents, you know, young parents, but you know what? You know, she chose to take a different path for herself, you know, and I wish her the best, you know, she's going off to, I don't know which college she probably had a numerous amount to choose from, you know, but um, she's a really, She's a good story, you know, inspiration. And I think um, Kyle and Mary have been very, very good in like um, examples for her. They, they've pushed her, they've helped her, you know, they've, they've been right there um, the whole step of the way, you know, every step of the way they've been there encouraging her. And I think that's awesome. That's very necessary for our, our parents to be encouraging us in these things as well, you know? Um, and like that one, like kind of gets me wants to get me going into the first question I have about you telling stories. And I kind of want to ask about your sister um, and her story and what happened to her. And then, like you said, telling the story of missing and murdered indigenous women. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my sister's name uh, was Nicole Smith. Uh, we grew up very close in age. We're about a year, a year and a half apart. Uh, we are a lot younger than most of my sisters, you know, about at least eight years between um, so we were kind of, you know, we stuck together. We were like, almost like twin sisters, you know, just a year and a half didn't seem very, very far. So we grew up pretty close. Um, on November 19th, I lived on the Manchester Reservation. I was the first house when you pull onto the reservation, closest to the road. Um, on November 19th, about five in the morning, I woke up to shotgun sounds and children screaming, kids screaming. Um, I soon found out that my 15 year old niece, Star Brightman, had not only been shot, but my sister Nicole had fatally been shot. Um, at that time, there was four adults in the house, three kids and two teenagers. Um, one was actually Yvonne's daughter, mm -hmm. Christy. Um, after after we realized what had happened, the kids were all taken to my parents' house for safety. And me and Christy and my niece Star remained in the house waiting for help. Now, here's where things start coming into play as far as, I can't really talk too much about the case as far as who and why and, and things like that, just because sometimes if you do that, it can affect you know Absolutely. the case itself and the police yeah. moving forward so i've learned to try to be a little bit more careful about that so i'll just speak on some of the things that uh happen as far as the sheriff's department and things like yeah. that absolutely so um you know living in a rural area means help is far away and we've all probably experienced something like that you know whether it be you know we need the police right then and now and 
you know, our sheriff is in Fort Bragg at the time because that's where he had gotten called or, or they were coming from 45 minutes away, you know, dr driving. So the ambulance, we do have those close by, but they're not allowed to come in unless it's cleared from the danger. We had one sheriff that had came on, but he couldn't do nothing until he had backup. So we're sitting there inside this house waiting, you know, and it, it was only about an hour, but it felt way longer. You know, I was getting to the point where I wanted to just put my sister in the car. I had called back and said, look, I can't wait anymore. Like, I got to get my sister help right now. Absolutely. You know, and they're like, don't move her. Don't move her. You can't, you know, move her. Um, as the time went on, you know, we realized my sister had already been gone. You know, she she wasn't there. Her body was lifeless. So we didn't do nothing but sit there and wait. We seen the police outside, one sh one guy outside, but there was no nobody coming to the door. The ambulance couldn't even enter the reservation. My niece Star, who was shot in her um, leg, they made her walk all the way out to the end off the res down the road to get into the ambulance. Um, you know, I can't say that this is how it would be in non-reservation housing, but it seemed very, very particular to the situation happening on the reservation that they felt unsafe to come on, yeah. you understand? Um, so if we have these untrained people like in these positions that don't, you know, that have the stereotype of the reservation, dangerous, can't come on. Yeah, it is, but it's not any more dangerous than anywhere else the only thing that makes it more dangerous is you're scared to help yeah it makes it more dangerous for us to yeah. need you because when we do you're too scared to come on you know and it's like so who you know what what makes it dangerous or for who you know it's who? more dangerous for the people living there you know where we have these stereotypes from the police department you know like oh it's a dangerous place to be you can't go on then we put you know, our reservations are in these rural areas where we don't have help coming, you know. And I think this is kind of what um, attributes to these statistics for the MMIW about our women, you know, our cases not being solved, that we have more cases unsolved than any other demographic, you know. So with all that being said, the police didn't come for a long time. You know, my sister may or may have not been able to be saved you know we we don't know if the time difference had made anything you know but um as far as traumatic experience for the people who were involved like me and my niece and christy you know having to sit there and wait and see help but nobody coming in and you know things like that it just does have a long lasting effect on you know on myself on my niece star on christy i'm sure you know um, so things like that, that's just one, one part of what had happened that night. Um, the Mendocino County Sheriff's Department has not made any breakthroughs in the case since then. This happened in 2017. Um, they've been out of contact with our family for over two years. We've called them and asked, you know, anything, is there any news, is there any, you know, any information that you could tell us, any, like, any hope? that anything's, you know, being done. Oh, you know, we can't really talk to you about that. And, oh, your your case has been moved to new detectives, you know, the, or stop calling with these leads because now we have to go and investigate and waste valuable time every time you guys think you heard something, you know, and it's like, wait, you want us to stop telling you what we hear on the street, yeah. but you don't want to make any progress you know, because you, you hear things, um, you know, here and there, not all the time, not as much as we like. We do have a, a reward, a $20,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of, you know, whoever was involved with my sister's murder. Um, but there's been nothing. We've gotten nothing but silence back from the Mendocino Sheriff's Department. I know Khadija Britton's case, you know, she's a missing woman from Coblo. Um at the same time, this she went missing after I would I'm not sure the exact time, but about a week or two after my sister's murder. 
Um, it might have been closer to a week. And my uh, my condolences and heart goes out to the um, Britain family for their, you know, what they're going through with Katisha. Mm -hmm. But the sheriff's department did go ahead and tell her, tell me, you know, look, we have a girl, another native girl who's missing right now. And we're the only ones to work on both these. We need to, we can't be working on your sister's case right now when we have a missing girl missing that could still be alive. Your sister's already passed away. You know, like we need to find this girl. <clears throat> you know, so the fact of them using another indigenous woman's story against our family to kind of make us suppress what we wanted done was not fair, you know? Yeah. There should be multiple resources if that's the case, you know? I know taxpayers pay a lot of money and our our indigenous people, like I've told them before, we make up a big demographic of voters when you get elected sheriff, you know? There's so many reservations in Mendocino County. You know, if we got together and really pushed as a people for things to change within the sheriff's department, things could happen and that's where things need to happen. Absolutely. You know, that's tribal councils coming together saying, look, we need answers. We need to know if you guys can't afford it, let's find a solution for that. You know, because I'm sure that a lot of tribes would like to see something happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what happened with the sheriff's department and my sister. You know, like I said, we've been out of communication for a long time. And it's hard. It's hard to keep asking and not getting any response or just, you know, oh, nothing, there's nothing, you know, they, they've uh, questioned me multiple times, you know, at my sister's funeral, they swore that they needed to speak with me, that it was, you know, gonna break the case open and they could solve the case right then if they spoke with me and it had to happen. They pulled me out for two hours from my own sister's funeral. And, and hounded me like I was under investigation. And, and, you know, I told them things I knew, you know. One thing is they say, you know, they, they do these trainings, but that the Sheriff's Department does training specifically to learn how to communicate and talk to Native communities. So apparently there is some kind of structure that they have going on that, uh, you know, apparently teaches them how to interact with us, you know, and I don't know what that, I'm interested to know what that looks like. I want to know what, who teaches that class. Is it, is it a white guy that teaches that class or who teaches that class? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I'd like to see the curriculum and what they yeah. think, you know, honestly, I want to know, you know, and, um, you know, when I told them something that I felt maybe was uh, really a connecting thing of why this could have happened at my sister, to my sister or to my house, you know, something that had to do with in, like our cultural beliefs and things like that, they laughed at me, you know? And, and I said, at that point, I was done. I, I was just done. It, you know, I was like, you know what? Don't come asking me questions. I'm trying to tell you you know, this is what happened. This is what could have happened. You know, I said these things. And when you say these things in our people's way, it's a bad thing, you know. Um, and for them to laugh and act like that was totally just a stupid idea of, oh, stupid Indians, you know, like, oh, stupid Indians. That's what I got out of it, you know. Yeah. So it kind of made me shut down after that. I was just, I, I, I didn't, you know, want to give them any more information. It was just you know, done for me. It, it and, seems like, uh, you know, anything. Go ahead. It seems like they don't want to do their job. And like, they're using, like you said, they're using another woman to, as an excuse to not do their job, not get in the streets and actually ask questions. Yeah. And that goes, that goes back to years and years of them not doing their job on reservations. And then like, that kind of leads into my next question of you talking about like, having a lot of reservations in the area and like, people wanting like having a lot of native voters how do you feel about natives getting involved in politics and like because i think me personally i think if we get more involved and have like like you said have everyone join in as groups and vote together and that's how we change the system that's how we get people to be recognized and um that's how we get mmiw on the map if we get in these spaces and 
change the po the policies. And I want to see yeah. your thoughts on people getting involved in politics. Well, I definitely feel like it's it's time. It's needed. Um, one thing for sure is that starts with education. You know, nobody would even know what the possibilities are without you know hearing about them. And those things they don't teach those things at a at a native celebration. You know, they don't teach those things at a big time. Those are things that you can only hear about in certain institutions like college. You know, um, so it's really important that we allow our kids and youth to have an opportunity to even imagine what they can do. And that only starts with getting them in these classrooms, getting them around other like-minded natives, you know? Absolutely. That's where, um, you know, things like that have, have happened for me. Like I keep reaching these roadblocks. And, and again, I'm gonna go back to my work with the acorns, um, you know, trying to get policies and, and things changed as far as it's all legislative, you know? forestry companies you think what does that have to do with this or that but it, it all has to do with these policies that are put in place with these money making forestry companies that yeah. control the law the environmental laws you know that you would think they would have nothing to do with one or the other but they do they actually you know you can't have one without the other you know somebody's funding these policies to be made you know, herbicides are still being poisoned. Uh, our forests are still being poisoned by herbicide with no no education on what's it doing to the plants around it, what it could potentially do to harm the environments around it, not just the animals, but the watersheds. You know, the culture, the living culture of acorn gathering, what that means for our people still living today. You know, without these policies being changed, without these practices being monitored, then you know, nothing's going to happen. I've went to many um, different, I guess they call them actions, where we go into the forestry companies like Mendocino, um, Mendocino Redwood Company. We brought some tri tribal youth there along with Earth First, another environmental group, activism group, um, to go and speak to them and, and tell them that what they're doing to the tan oak tree is, is hurting our people, our culture, generations to come. This tree's already going to be extinct just from sudden oak death. Yeah. the disease that's plaguing the oaks. I know out in Santa Cruz, there's plenty of work being done to protect the oaks out there. And this is not being done tribally. This is just being done by non-native people that are concerned with the environment and sudden oak death, you know? There's been practices put in place where they protect those trees and they can't be cut and they can't be, you know, um, disposed of. Well, those things, and you take that over here in Mendocino County where the biggest part of the economic uh, life force is forestry. You know, um, that's a lot harder to do. You know, that's a lot harder to do. So going into these places, these forestry companies and, and telling them what they're doing, one of the men told me himself, he said, your problem isn't in this room. You need the law changed if you want this done. We just follow the law. Yeah. So you are you can come in here and we understand you're emotional about this, but this is not the place to, to bring your story to. Yeah. You know, and that was a, a, I was, I was happy he told me that because nobody really told, I didn't know, you know, you're, you're just going in, um, you're going into these things and, and going off emotion. You're just going off of what the creators, you feel you're doing the right thing. You don't really have a direction. Yeah. You know, I know if I was a little more educated and went to school and, you know, was able to know exactly how this line of, you know, defense worked then I'm sure that, you know, I'd be able to have a lot more done and, and pushed and, you know, but it also always comes back to tribal support. You know, you have to have your tribe behind you. They want to see your tribe saying, yes, we agree yeah. with her. We agree with this. Yes, we want this too, because this is a, the federally recognized tribe is, you know, something that they have to listen to. They don't have to really listen to one person, but once the tribe gets involved, it's a, a government to government issue. So yes, you know, we need more people involved in politics, natives involved in politics. Um, you know, I was reading, reading a little bit about Deb Holland, Secretary of Interior. You know, we're really happy that she's in. I think it's long overdue, you know, to have somebody who is the head of the United States Department of Interior, the secretary, responsible for the management and conservation of most federal land and natural resources. 
but that is a big, big step. You know, we have somebody on our team in there, but she can only do so much, you know, like she still needs us as people here to say, this is what we want. This is what we need because our differences and our needs change from every area. Like, you know, the water, the name changing, whatever it is that you yeah. want done, but you know, particularly on the federal land, that's our tribal land. Yeah. And like you said, voting, voting is a, a big, a big thing. Like, you know, we need to get out and vote. We need to, yeah, and it sucks having to vote for these politicians. It sucks having to want to be involved in these. But like, like we keep saying, these policies won't change unless we get involved. Yeah, you know and that's I mean? another one of the stereotypes that, you know, or not stereotypes, that's another one of those um, beliefs or, or just, I'm not sure the word I'm looking for, but how you said about education, natives thinking about education being a white, a white thing. Well, voting has, you know, and that might be some kind of systematic oppression that they put in our minds to think that voting is a white man and don't do it. You know what I mean? Like, don't conform. That could also be something that they systematically put in our minds to think, you know, we don't know anymore at this point. Yeah, a long, you know? time, a long time for me is I, I didn't want to contribute to a system that stole from my people. But I think with that mindset think about how many people have that mindset are and are losing like the right people that need to be in the office are losing those votes yeah you know what i mean and that's we need to just encourage people to vote and get out there and be part of uh, these spaces that they don't want us in because no no the the government doesn't want in these us in these spaces they don't want us to be educated they don't want us to be they, like you said, they put these things in our head that we don't belong in these spaces and that needs to just, we need to er eradicate those thoughts in our communities. Yeah. And that kind of, um, and you were kind of talking about like, um, like the, um, we have this um, kind of negative thought about ourselves at times. And this kind of plays into like the, the way that people portray us in like, like famous mascots such as like the um washington football team who just changed their name um they they portray the natives in a in a different in a, in a cartoony way in a way that doesn't exist like you were saying like um like a novelty like when people see see natives they kind of point and um i just want to see your thoughts on the finally them finally starting to change names and sports teams of negative derogatory um mascots towards native americans yes yeah, so with that i have to admit you know for a, a long time well growing up when i see somebody wearing like a redskins jersey or something you know i feel like a connection to them i feel like oh they're native like you know you kind of feel like like oh somebody like i know like they're native too most mostly if they look native anyways wearing yeah. that you know can yeah. identify to them because of, you know, wearing things like that. As you get older, you realize what those terms meant and what they mean, you know, and you, and I'm down, if there's native people feeling some type of way towards something and they have, you know, just reason and cause, then I'm behind them 100%, no questions asked, you know. I know there's a lot of issues out there that people think that, oh, you know, this, this is just one thing that maybe doesn't need all that attention. I've heard a lot of uh, comments on this subject before where, you know, some people were like, you know, resources should be saved more for something more important, you know, instead of all this attention on a mascot name that doesn't really affect us, but it does really affect us. And we don't know that it does, you know, and that's kind of where they come with blindsiding us with, you know, calling or redskins. We, we just, we identify with that, you know, and, and that's, part of that same oppression you know we don't realize that that's what it is and we're comfortable with it you know i know african-american people feel the same way you know when people use a certain word but they feel like it's they could say you know but nobody else and that's what i mean that's kind of like that oppressive thinking that it, it's okay but it's it's really not you know so i'm really glad that they changed the names i'm i know that it's a victory it's a win for our people and I'm all about that. Hell yeah, yeah, me too. And I'll, like, I, 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 I was the same way. Like, oh yeah, like 
now that you say that it kind of makes me think like oh yeah that's that's tight they're they're representing like natives but then like like again like you said when we get older we realize these words are like super negative and they're like make make you feel like ugly about yourself they don't make you feel good they make you feel a negative way um and yeah um that's kind of all the questions that i had i think um and uh, yeah, let's talk about a little bit more about Acorn, um, the the work that you do with them. Yeah, so that's kind of where um, what I've been doing for the last few years, uh, working with Acorn, um, learning about Acorn. It was kind of just a, a self self taught thing, uh, just learning a b little bit about the um, the forestry companies and the herbicide use and killing of the tan oak tree. At that time, I I didn't even know the tan oak was the acorn tree. That's what I called acorn tree, you know? And then I found out what was happening and then I kind of researched it and found out about sudden oak death and kind of realized, you know, what the inevitable was, was 100% of these trees are going to be gone. You know, and, and what does that mean for us, you know? You really had to sit and think about it like, okay, how important is this tree? Well, you start looking through history and you kind of start realizing that everything we've ever been in anywhere in California has all came back to the acorn, you know, um, our survival, our sustainability has always been because of this, you know, beautiful, beautiful tree and beautiful gift from the creator. So being able to uh, find where those acorns are, which if you look around our reservation, you won't see any tan oak trees. Um, they're always a mountain view road, you know, so that's the first time where I went, uh, found some with Lorraine Lewa. She's pulled over on the road and said, look, you know, we're going to try to gather some acorns from here. Well, little did I know, you know, years later, I'm going back to Mountain View Road because that's the only place I knew where to gather any. You know, it's very dangerous. It's off the side of these windy roads. You know, trying to take children to gather from there is just not, not safe, yeah. you know. <clears throat> and I was trying to find where, where the tan oaks were. So I looked where the forestry company had been, you know, killing all these tan oak trees. And when I, when I learned about it, it was a, a measure B that was happening. So something that was going to be coming up to vote on in Mendocino County was about the herbicide use. Uh, the problem that the non-native people had with them using the herbicide wasn't about the cultural value of the tree. And, you know, it wasn't, of course, nothing indigenous related. Yeah. It was about a fire hazard you know, leaving these dead standing trees in these large forest areas that are prone to fires, you know, it's going to cause tremendous damage, you know, yeah. to their properties. So, uh, you know, when I came in, I kind of was like, oh, wait a minute, that's the least of your worries, you know, these fires, if anything, you know, this, the, the extinction of this sacred tree for our people, you know, is kind of a bigger issue that to be looked at, if not you know, equally as important. So working with that and trying to see, uh, I found out that up on Eureka Hill Road, I don't know if you've ever been to the air base in Point Arena, yeah. way up top. That's actually, I was when acorn picking with Aunt Lorraine too, up there as well. Yeah, Long so time. that's where all the big trees are, yeah. you know? Um, so that, that particular space, that air base had been closed for, I don't know, over 30 something years, you know, people were, freely to go and party there or whatever they wanted to do. Well, that was the first time I seen the property about six years ago. Um, I thought it'd be a great place to have an acorn festival to kind of, um, that's where all the acorn trees are, you know? All the ones on Mountain View Road look like twigs compared to the ones up there. You know, the acorns are so big up on top of that mountain. A little bit more research, I found out that that's exactly where our people were. You know, we weren't down the bottom where we are now on the reservation, which makes sense. You know, that's where they put us. Yeah. That's the most uh, barren land they could find, you know, where they needed us to work for them and be, you know, work on their, um, on the farmlands and help them as, you know, working yeah. for these farmers and dairy farmers and being the nannies for these babies. And, you know, so they put us at a convenience for them. Mm -hmm. Well, a little more history research found out that we hosted over 30 tribes there that would come and gather acorn every year. We'd have a fest, not a festival. They just called it a gathering. You know, everybody would eat the acorn. Um, different tribes would come and all gather right there. 
Um, then I went out into the community and started asking a little bit more questions and people found out or started telling me about all the artifacts they'd find on, on, on Eureka Hill Road. Somebody just gave me a pestle, beautiful pestle found right outside the airbase line, which kind of solidified what I always knew, what I always felt there was that, you know, our people were here, you mm -hmm. know, living, thriving in this particular area, the same area that these forestry companies are coming, killing off all the tan oaks. We have property owners taking down, you know, hundreds and hundreds of year old trees. And then we have sudden oak death that is killing. I mean, I've seen these beautiful big trees that I know, I know our ancestors gathered from, you know, just rotting out from sudden oak death, you know? These things could be treated. We could use traditional burning practices to help these, but then, you know, they're scared because all these dead trees from the forestry companies, of course, they're not gonna, you know, any little match, a whole side of the hill can be done, you know? Yeah. So um, I propose, you know, for our people to go ahead and start moving forward, trying to get the air base back to our people, to the tribe, you know, a potential area where we can grow fresh new tan oaks there, protect them, keep them safe, have this garden, because, you know, like everybody knows, like seven generations, you always hear this, seven generations, seven generations. What does that mean? That means we're not thinking about ourselves now. We're not thinking about today or tomorrow. We're thinking about our great, great, great grandkids. What do they have? You know, that's what I think about. I keep reading all these different quotes from all these different beautiful leaders, you know, from all around the United States, indigenous leaders that talk about that. Like, let's not live in the present. You know, we have to think about the future of our kids. You know, there's a beautiful land up there. It's federal, federal land. That's why I'm really glad that Deb Holland's in now, you know, when we want to open up that line of communication, then we have somebody in there, you know, but my voice isn't enough, yeah. you know, me saying it is not enough. Our tribal council need to say, this is what we want. This is what we need, you know? So that's where, because of politics and things like that, you know, within our tribe, I've hit many roadblocks, you know, but hopefully, you know, somebody from, out there can hear what I'm talking to you about and say, hey, you know, this is a good idea. I know acorns it might not, you know, might not be everybody's cup of tea, but I know your mom loves it, you know? Loves it. So, loves it. yeah, so, um, you know, and there was last year we used, because uh, we couldn't have the acorn festival. It will be happening though, uh, October 16th, hopefully, you know, we're still in negotiations with the, what happened with the air base is the Air Force, now is trying to say it's active again and so it's a base now an active base so they shut they lock the gates that never been locked for 40 years you know now there's chains and locks and we have to get permission and if we don't then you know but we we have been able to have the acorn festival up there for four years already oh, nice. yeah you know and we have people come and we dance and we eat and we just really want to establish that connection back to the land i know a lot of people have asked like why not have the acorn festival on the reservation. Why do you have to go out, you know, off and, and, you know, people have said like, I provide for the white people or, you know, making a show for them, but it's really not that. It's trying to establish that, you know what, you put us on this reservation, but our borders don't stop there. Yeah. You know, we have access to land. There is land available out there, not being used that we could use it, not for gaming, you know, but for other things like, cultural enrichment, things that have more value than a dollar will ever have. And that's, you know, our, our values. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, that was one of my last questions was um, anything from your culture that you that you practice or you wanted to share with any other people. And, um, and I didn't know that that was original land. And I think that's in, in like, it's such an awesome idea to have that festival or that gathering there in that original place where those original trees are, where the, your an, like the ancestors picked from. You know how, like, how good that would feel to pick from those same trees that your ancestors picked from or cook those same acorns from that same tree or sit, just a lot, let alone sit under that same tree that your ancestors sat under and think and just to think and just to have time in the woods or in the forest yeah it, it's a beautiful thing and even like we still have opportunity you know these trees might be dying from sudden oak death but they still produce acorn and acorn is a seed 
the seed is the children of the tree. You know, we can replant those. We can make more. We can uh, continue the life of those trees of our ancestors and honor them. But we just need a space to do that. You know, these trees thrive on top of Eureka Hill Road. They need the certain amount of sun. They need a certain amount of elevation that, unfortunately, our reservations just don't provide. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, it's not impossible. It's something that could happen. You know, it's something that will happen. But we just need to keep moving forward and, you know, building momentum and, and making it something that that's a necessity for our people. It's medicinal. It's healing. You know, it's a sacred food, a spiritual food. And, you know, just I'll, I'll never, you know, that's the message that the creator gave me to bring to the people, you know, in my little way that I can. You know, I'm just a, a normal girl, woman, you know, but this is just what I know I'm supposed to do. And hopefully, even if it takes, you know, not even if I don't ever see it happen, I hope that I instill something in, in one of the young women or men from our tribe that can get this done. And like I said, it. it they all want to talk to the council. That's where they tell me, and that's where my roadblock has always been at. They want the council to say, this is what we want. You know, yeah. I was able to push through to get, um, you know, uh, luckily Obama had made a little stipulation that says tribal uh, cultural leaders, like spiritual leaders can have just as much say over certain things as a tribal council when it comes to negotiations. So we were able to swing that to get the Acorn Festival happening at the at the um, air base, you know, by using my father and Clarence Carrillo as the spiritual leaders of our tribe to say this needs to be done and this is where it needs to be done at. And so that's kind of where, luckily, you know, like so those little things, those little yeah. those little laws that you know can be changed and made that can kind of help out little causes like. Like what we had, you know, for the acorn. So those yeah, things are important. Absolutely. And I wanted to, my Aunt Lois was in, is in here and she said, yes, uh, exclamation point to your acorn comment. And it's how good it is. Um, yeah. So she knows she loves that stuff. Um, yeah. And then lastly, I just wanted to ask you if there's any questions you had for me or any other topics that you wanted to bring up and push to the people. And yeah, just go ahead and just anything you want to talk about. Um, yeah, so the work you were doing with the homeless and things like that, I've also uh, have, you know, tried to work in that area, you know, trying to bring awareness to the homeless uh, native community in Santa Rosa, which was a huge population. Uh, there is a YouTube video I had put up about the homeless population that are uh, primarily Native American in Santa Rosa. There was a big homeless encampment there. Um, a lot of them say, you know, like their tribe doesn't provide anything for them. Their tribe, you know, some of them, of course, you know, could be on drugs or alcohol or whatever their uh, circumstances are. You know, um, our people have kind of, you know, made them feel like they're not welcome in that state when really, you know, they're sick yeah. it is what it is. You know, it's a sickness. We take it back hundreds of years before those things were even introduced to us. We would never shun them for things like that, you know. These are uh, things that were brought on to to keep us down and, and to separate us and to to, to divide us and um, just keeping that work going with the homeless. I know I feel for them. I do, and I commend you for the work that you're doing out there with that. Um, but there are a lot of Native community members that are are homeless out there in the streets, and I think that's something that you know we could maybe work on, um, you know, together if you want to, like addressing. I know we can't save the world, but, you know, our Native people, we could maybe encourage tribes to come together and, and make something just for them, you know. At the air base actually was a proposed uh, site for a homeless shelter from San Francisco, not Native related. And they said it was too rural area that they didn't want to be there. You know, but there are other places like that, that, you yeah. know, federal land that's not being used that we could use to house Native homeless you know, people. So I'm down to work with you with whatever like that. And, you know, I really commend you on, on your heart. That takes a lot. It does take a lot out of somebody to see people in that position and not have people there to help them. It, it's heartbreaking. And it takes a really strong person to be able to look that situation in the eye and reach out a hand. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, it did take a lot of my mental. So I've taken a little bit of a break. But now that I hear, because I haven't done anything in Mendocino County or I haven't done anything in um, Santa Rosa, 
and those are the communities that I grew up in. Those are the communities that I'm from. So absolutely want to come up there as soon as I can with COVID kind of ending, you know, mask mandates being lifted. Um, I want to get as many donations up there as I can because um, I have everything I need to cook food. I have um, big, big pots and pans. I just need a space to do it and other people to help me. So I absolutely would love to link up and get this going in Santa Rosa as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I know Christmas time is a, a crucial time for them, you know, around the holidays, um, things like that. Um, and you're welcome to come to the Acorn Festival. I'll be putting some more information about that uh, as soon as I get the confirmation back from the people I'm in contact with at the airbase, you know, to confirm a date and stuff. But, you know, if you can come help learn how to build a brush house, you know, things like that, it's always welcome. And we need as many men out there to help because it, it's a process. I would love to help. I, I haven't been home in a long time. I really need to, and I need to go help people in my community. And yeah, I would love to do all of that. So let's, yeah, definitely. Plus let's... I can help you gather the acorns for your mom because she, yeah. she really loves it. She, she, she loves, loves that stuff. She was actually talking about it the other day, if you had any or had any to give her. Yeah, I think my sister, um, Natalie, had given her some just the other day. Oh, okay, I think. okay, cool, yeah. cool, yeah, she was, she was yeah. asking about it. Um, but yeah, let's keep in contact and let's plan something soon, definitely, because um, now that I hear there's a large Native community in, in Santa Rosa, I definitely want to go. And that's, yeah. uh, that, that's definitely something that's going to be on my mind from now on. So, okay. um, so that's definitely going to be something I'm going to be planning. Um, yeah, so let's, I'll, I'll be in contact with you hopefully soon. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for joining me again. I really, really appreciate it. You taught me a lot. You had opened me up, opened my mind. And thank you very much for joining me. And I, I hope you the best in all your journeys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. See you. Okay, bye. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, thank you, Eloisa, for the feedback. Um, again, if anybody wants to join me, um, you can comment on here, tap into my DMs, my Facebook account, whatever, on YouTube. This is going to go on all those platforms. And again, I'm opening up to all people of color, not just indigenous people. If you want to join me, just tap in with me and we can set up a time, get something happen. Peace, love, and happiness.